Hey, uh, our next guest is uh, a, an author as well. And when we do these segments, John sets up most of them because of his occupation. He's uh, opened up a door for us on the program that had not previously been opened. And we always hand the introductions over to John in these situations. Mr. Gilstrap. Well, <clears throat> more times than not, I have some kind of a direct connection to the author who's coming on. Either we share a publicist or a publisher, or I just know them personally. In this case, <clears throat> I get um, I, there, are, there are author news feeds that I sign on to, and there's, there's a thing called BookBub. And BookBub's a big deal. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a promotional uh, thing that th when we get these these the 23 best usually it's 23 i don't know why it's 23 um and this was i think the 23 best summer reads or something like that and i opened mm -hmm. it up and the very first one i saw was a book called in the shadow of the Greenbrier, and it's by emily matchar i hope i got your name right i'm going to give you a chance to correct that in just a second but i, I thought i'm a huge fan of the Greenbrier uh, uh resort and of course it's featured under a different name in the Victoria Emerson series that I wrote. So I reached out to, to Emily through her website and said, would you be interested in coming on the show? And, and first of all, is it the same one? And it is the same Greenbrier. Would you be interested in coming on the show? And she was gracious enough to say, yes, we have not actually met yet. So good morning, Emily. Oh, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. And how do you say your last name? Matcher. You Matt. got it. Okay. Oh, you nailed it. Good job. All right. Yeah. So tell, tell us about the, the, well, you actually sent, told me in an email, so the origins of, of the book, sort of the story behind the story. Yeah. So this goes back to around 2007, and I was a, a young newspaper reporter in North Carolina, where I'm from, at a small town paper. And one weekend, um, me and uh, another reporter, we were bored, and we decided to take a road trip. We decided to take a road trip to West Virginia, um, sort of with not much of an agenda. Um, you know, I was like 24 and, uh, you know, didn't have any responsibilities and said, hey, yeah, let's drive to West Virginia and see what we see. Um, now, at some point during the trip, I read something about the Greenbrier and the tour that you could take. And I said, well, that sounds interesting. We've got to do that. Um, so we we drove to White Sulphur Springs and we did the the bunker tour. And I was I mean, it's obviously it's a it's a fascinating resort. It has a fascinating history in all sorts of dimensions, but there was one thing that the tour guide said. Um now how, how familiar do you think most of your listeners are with the Greenbrier? Like most people in West Virginia. I'd say somewhat. I think for the yeah. most part, they're pretty familiar. The governor of West Virginia owns the place. Yeah, so. yeah. that's right. Okay. So, you know, sometimes depending on where I am, I, I explain more or less, but, um, but, you know, most people probably know that there's, there's the bunker underneath the Greenbrier that was built during the Cold War that was intended as a shelter for Congress in the case of a, you know, Russian nuclear attack. And that, was a secret until 1992 and the cold war was over and now you can go tour it. Now, when I did the tour, something the tour guide said was just totally fascinating to me. Now she was, she was a local of, of white sulfur Springs. And she said, look, when they were building this bunker, we all knew that they were doing something, you know, they said they're building a new wing. They said it was a foundation or a basement, but we all, we all understood that it was something much more than that. But we also understood that it was meant to be a secret and that it was our job to help keep that secret. And I just thought like that was wild that this small town would know that there was a secret of sort of national importance in their backyard and that nobody would spill that secret. And nobody did. Nobody did for 30 years. And when the secret did come out in the Washington Post in, in 1992, it wasn't because of someone in White Sulphur Springs. It was because of somebody in Washington, D.C. So I thought, wow, the idea of a town keeping a secret like that, that's, that's something. I want to write a novel about this place. Now, it took me about 15 years to, to do that. Um, some things happened in the, in the interim, but, um, but that was the seed of inspiration. So that, that random weekend trip I took to West Virginia. That's a pretty cool story. 
Yeah. yeah. And it's pretty uh, impressive and patriotic that they would keep that secret. Now, when, when I was a, a kid growing up in Pittsburgh, I remember in my grade school, this would have been in the 70s, my teacher said, and this was, uh, uh, it was a Catholic school, but this was not a nun taught class. This was uh, a lay teacher, Armando Del Duca. Great name, by the way. Right? That is. It's a Saturday yeah. Night Live. <laughs> what an Italian name. Surprisingly, with an Italian teacher. Uh, he said that there was, supposedly, there were rumors that there was an underground place in the mountains of West Virginia that Congress would go to in the event of a cold, of a nuclear strike. And this is in the 70s, which is right up there in the height of the Cold War era. So it was kind of rumored, and the specific uh -huh. location wasn't known, but it was rumored that there was something in the hills of West Virginia underneath a mountain somewhere. So now you're connecting the two together. Now you know what they're talking about. Now I know what they're talking about. Right? Yeah. So uh, take us through the plot of this book, please. So it's it's um, it's sort of a family epic. It's about a family. Um, I, I have four characters in four different time periods who are all members of the same Jewish family that run a shop in White Sulphur Springs. So this is, the family is fictional. Um, so we, we start with the, the patriarch is Saul, who comes to America as a teenage immigrant from Lithuania in, um, in the early 20th century. He wants to escape um, being drafted into the Tsar's army, which was not a good fate at the time. Um, so he comes and he winds up being a peddler in the coal fields of, of West Virginia, which was um, which was a way that people in the coal fields got, you know, stuff back then. A, a peddler would come through with a pack or on a horse, and he would usually be, um, you know, a young Jewish guy, immigrant, or sometimes um, Lebanese. Um, and he would have a pack full of stuff, um, you know, just little necessities like hair combs and eyeglasses and symbols and all these sort of little things that were, were hard to get in such far flung locations. So my character Saul, he starts out as a peddler in the coal fields and then he winds up opening a shop in White Sulphur Springs around the time that the the modern building of the Greenbrier is being built. The Greenbrier itself is a lot older, but um, you know, the building's gone through various iterations. Um and then the second character we meet here chronologically is Sylvia, who's Saul's daughter-in-law, and she's a Polish refugee during um, World War II. And now the, the bunker is one of the, you know, really fascinating historical things about the Greenbrier that I think a lot of people know. But another fascinating historical thing about the Greenbrier, which is like slightly less known, is that during World War II, so right after Pearl Harbor, um, the, the officials in Washington, D.C. found themselves with a problem, which was that all of a sudden they had all of these diplomats, these German and Italian and Japanese diplomats, who were suddenly enemy diplomats once Pearl Harbor happened and we went to war. And they couldn't just let them, you know, keep running around Washington, D.C., but you also can't just throw diplomats in your local jail. That's not, not acceptable. Not, it goes against international law, et cetera, et cetera. So somebody in Washington, D.C. called the manager of the Greenbrier. Now, D.C. and the Greenbrier have always had a strong connection um, and, uh, and said, look, can we turn your resort into a temporary diplomatic detention camp? And the manager of the Greenbrier said, yes. So basically, they got rid of all the guests and they turned the, the Greenbrier into a temporary diplomatic detention camp where they brought in. Um, first, it was it was German and then Italian diplomats and their families, who were were treated somewhat like guests, but were also very much detained. They couldn't leave the grounds. There were guards around the Greenbrier. So my character Sylvia, she comes to work at the Greenbrier during this period and and becomes involved with one of the Italian diplomats who's being detained. So. Fast forward to my third character, and now we're back to the bunker. So this is now Dory, Sylvia's daughter, who is living in, in who's a teenager in 1959, and um, and the the bunker is being built, and so she's sort of seeing this happen and seeing this strange secret unfolding. And then um, the fourth character is in 1992 when the bunker is revealed, and he is the the son of Dory, the 
great grandson of Saul. And his name is Jordan, and he's a reporter at the Washington Post who's trying to uncover the secret of the Greenbrier. Now, in reality, the person who sort of spilled the Greenbrier secret was a Washington Post reporter named Ted Gupp. Um, so I fudged the details by having it be my character. So that gives you an overview. It's four, four members of this, of this Jewish family who are living in the shadow of the Greenbrier during these various important times during the 20th century when the Greenbrier was really at the cent center of these interesting world historical events. Emily, thank you for your Italian representation in this story. I completely <laughs> and totally approve. Thank you. I, I, there's, you know, yes, it's a, a, a good noticing. I do have an Italian character, an important Italian character in every timeline. Nice. What, what, what's, uh, give me some names of the Italian characters. Okay, so, um, so Saul um, meets a bunch of Italian miners, and they're, they're unnamed, but he meets a bunch of Italian miners who play an important role in his life um, in the coal fields. Um, you know, as you know, it, Italians came to West Virginia as, as miners. Yes. Um, and, uh, and then Sylvia becomes involved with an Italian by the unlikely name of Jack. He has an English mother. Um, and then Dory becomes romantically involved with an Italian employee at the Greenbrier called Tony. Um, and then my fourth character at the Washington Post um, has an Italian uh, editor, an Italian-American editor. So. Well, I approve. That's four Italians in this story, Gilstrap. How many did you put in your book? <clears throat> Well, I kill most of them, so you know, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm one of them. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think we've been showing that your the book cover for um, uh, In Shadow of the Greenbrier, and after the war, they were left with this military facility that now needed to be converted back to a hotel. So they brought in Dorothy Draper to do the interior designs, and and actually, if you visit, and I recommend. I, I love the Greenbrier. So anybody who wants to go. The, there's an oppressive sort of floral feel to the decorations of the Greenbrier now, which is the Dorothy Draper designs. And that's actually reflected in your in your book cover, which mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. not an oppressive way. I didn't mean to say that, but, <laughs> but it's clearly it has a very Greenbriery look on on the cover of. of yes, the staircase of, uh, of the presidential suite, I believe, with Dorothy Draper's sort of iconic orchid wallpaper in the background. So when did the book come out? It came out um, in March of this year. Okay, very well. And you happy with it? Is it who's the publisher? It is uh, Putnam at Penguin Random House. Okay, and and are you on a deadline too for the next one? Um, I've finished the next one, so oh, now I'm uh, cool wrapping in on the third one. <laughs> so <laughs> take a lesson, you'll start. <laughs> ah. I don't want to hear about anybody yeah. who's finished the next. I one. think she just gave a shot across the bow for you, uh -huh. John. <laughs> Yeah, John's facing a deadline in July. Oh, gosh. Well, solidarity. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you face deadlines, Emily? Do you, do you stress about them, or do they just flow naturally for you and your work? Oh, gosh, both. I mean, I, I, I just try to not focus too much on the big picture and just do the small amount that I know that I can do every day, and eventually it adds up. I wrote this book in 500 words a day, which is not that much. Um, but, you know, you do that for a year, you get a book. So, you know, I just I tried not to, you know, look at the think too much about the deadline or the bigger picture and just, you know, keep my eye on the page. And yeah, it's hard, though. It is hard. So did this turn into a series or the I guess we've counted for three books now to the first two and then the one you're writing now. So is it a series or are they standalones? No, they're standalones. They're all historical fiction, um, but they they're not related to each other. That's what I was wondering. Is it go was it going to be a series um, that that adds on to this to the Greenbrier? No, no, not so the Greenbrier. And in fact, the second and third are both set in North Carolina, where I, where I am from. Hmm. So, is the Greenbrier gift shop uh, stacked with these things? That's a good question. Um, can somebody go and? Uh, I and think, tell me. I think you need to get <laughs> the governor to, to to put it out there on a on one of his weekly uh, weekly uh, broadcasts there with Baby Dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot about Baby Dog since before you said. Are that. you familiar with Baby Dog? <laughs> no. Okay. Oh, the, uh, governor Justice is is a big fella, and uh -huh. um, in uh, in in all dimensions, and six he, eight five hundred pounds. Yes. 
and and that's not exaggeration. And he's he's got a bulldog, I guess. Mm-hmm. Of equal name, proportion. Uh-huh. A baby dog, and baby dog eats a lot of Wendy's. And <laughs> and people will stand in line, long lines to meet baby dog. And um, they don't care much as much about the government. They that's just true. Want to meet baby dog. <laughs> so it's uh, uh, no, but you should you talk to your folks at Putnam. That's this is this would be. A big deal, I would think. That's going to okay, be a well, dreamer. absolutely. If Baby Dog wants a copy, I will. I will send a copy for Baby Dog. Mm. The, the dog would appreciate it, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Emily, uh, we've had uh, various authors on, and I've, ne- I've never asked this question. Many of the authors we have on, probably most, are male. Uh, do you face a uh, different set of challenges as a female author in this genre than uh, than say Mr. Gilstrap would face? Well, you know. I think a lot of readers um, are women. R- women read more books. Um, that's just uh, that's 80%. A, a statistic. Yeah, there, there you go. I wasn't, I wasn't sure what it was, but, but they do. So I think it is, you know, it's an area where, you know, it's, it's fairly female, female heavy. I think a lot of historical fiction writers are female. There's a, a great community, um, you know, online. If you go on like Instagram, you know, people are super supportive of one another. So that's just a, a really lovely thing and i can't speak too much about about other genres but certainly in um in historical fiction literary fiction um you know a lot of women a lot of a lot of good support so what slice of history are you concentrating on this one kind of spans all of recent history ends up in the 1990s so what are you concentrating on now so um my second one is set during the depression and the third one is set 10 years after the Civil War. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I like, uh, you know, this is, this is my, my happy place is getting to research, um, you know, different, different historical time periods and what people would have been like then, what they would have worn, what they would have eaten. Um, that's so interesting to me. So it's really rewarding to get to, to write about different time periods. And, yeah, the, with the Greenbrier having four different, different time periods was challenging but also really really fun i had a bunch of books you know what what were the 40s like you know these books that talk about you know what people looked like and what were the hit songs and what you know what the skirt lengths were so that was really fun research for me that's too bad bill isn't co-hosting today he Mm -hmm. could have answered those questions himself (laughs) Uh, last question emily and and that Mm -hmm. is uh, in regards to uh the voice that you write in is does it flow differently if you're writing in a female voice versus a male voice? Same with you, John. I know you've done both. Um, I would say it flows differently just depending on who the character is, and I don't know that it's so much of a a male versus a female thing. I found Saul, who was um, who was the patriarch in the earliest time period in the in the in the shadow of the Greenbrier. I found him very easy to write. Um, and I found one of my female characters very easy to write and one much more challenging to write. And I think it, you know, it has to do with various, various factors, sort of who they are, what their environment is, what their temperaments are like, um, you know, what their, you know, accent or dialect might be like. Um, and, uh, and yes, yeah, so I don't know that it has for me as much to do with, with, with gender. John? Um, not consciously. There's no difference consciously. But I think it, I think it comes out differently on the page, but it's not something I I try to do. And Emily, where can we find your book? Um, find it online anywhere, Amazon, um, you know, Barnes and Noble, and certainly if you have a local independent bookshop. Um, you know, I, I got the privilege of reading at one in Lewisburg and um, a new chapter. So if you if you were near an independent bookshop, um, you know, I certainly love to support those and you can always ask for them to order it if they don't have a copy. And hopefully in the future to be on sale at the Greenbrier. At the, yeah, at the Greenbrier. Hey, thanks, sir. I hope so. Thanks for calling in, Emily. It's great meeting you. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Take care, Emily.